Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me for this talk. Uh, it's not the types of talk that I'm, I'm usually doing. So it's exciting to sort of get out of that uh, more scientific realm a little bit. Um, yeah, my talk's a little bit general, I guess. Uh, so perhaps if there's questions, uh, we can address those a little bit later. Uh, so I'll be talking a lot about my work that uh, was carried out uh, in South Africa just before I, I left South Africa. And then how I've sort of transitioned into work in Stockholm in Sweden, which is completely different to the stuff I was doing in, in Africa. But at the same time, there are some similarities. So I'll just discuss those a little bit. Just to give you some context and some background to what I was doing in Johannesburg at WITS. Um, in 2013, hopefully this video is, is playing, by the way. I'm not so sure how good the internet connection is. But uh, back in 2013, I was part of this discovery uh, made in Johannesburg uh, in the Rising Star Caves. It's a cave system in the cradle of humankind. Uh, yeah, about 40 kilometers northwest of Johannesburg. It was made by these two cavers that you see on the screen now. Uh, this is Rick Hunter squeezing through, and this is uh, from his YouTube channel. And another caver, Stephen Tucker, um, who you'll see at the end of this video. And they made this really amazing discovery of uh, human ancestors or hominin, hominin bones inside this chamber, about 40 meters below the ground. Uh, and and this, this find was, was absolutely fantastic uh, for many reasons. Um, and one of the reasons is that uh, this, this hominin that, that they had discovered was in abundance. So usually uh, in the fossil record, uh, when we're talking about humans or human ancestors, we usually find one or two bones or fragments of bones or teeth uh, that we start describing as new species and, and such. Um, and for the first time, we had uh, thousands and thousands of bones uh, deep inside this chamber. Um, and this is what the cave system looks like. Uh, we have the dinner lady chamber right there at the bottom of the left of the screen. This is where these fossils come from. Uh, I, of course, am a paleontologist and paleoanthropologist, so I study human evolution um, and evolution in general. Uh, and, and it's interesting to be on this project because this was the largest uh, fossil, uh, hominin fossil discovery on the continent of Africa to have ever been discovered. And it was the second largest in the world, only to another site in Spain, uh, which I'll talk briefly about right at the end of this, of this uh, presentation. So when Eric approached me for a talk, uh, and he said that the, the title of the talks for today would be uh, Dialogues with Dust, I, I had to think about this a little bit, and, and the answer was kind of staring me straight in the face. I, I can't really believe that and see it, but uh, paleontologists essentially have dialogues with dust all day long. That's, that's essentially all we do. Uh, because, you know, stone is, is lithified dust, and we're looking at fossils, which are, you know, essentially stone. Uh, and so what we like to do is, is look at the anatomy of fossils that we may find, uh, compared to other animals, uh, you know, describe the anatomies. And what we want to do is give a context to these fossils, right? So over here on the screen, you'll see uh, Homo naledi, which is that new hominin that had been discovered in South Africa. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's very nice seeing these sort of fossils and, uh, you know, what do they mean to us? What, what exactly does this mean to us? And to get those answers, we have to really delve a little bit deeper than the anatomy. And we have to start pulling together lots of different streams of information and data so that we can give context to these sites and to these finds. So Homo uh, we, we we asked a, a paleo artist to give us sort of a rendition of what he thinks Homo naledi would have looked like. And we have something like this. But utilizing the anatomy as well as the, the site, the cave site, and as well as the geology and other, mul other multiple lines of evidence. What was fascinating about Homo naledi in South Africa is that this hypothesis that, you know, this, this, this creature, which is, by the way, 300,000 years old, uh, is, is actually disposing of its dead in a cave system. 
and, and it's deliberately doing this. Uh, we don't call this a burial. This is, burial has a, another, uh, it has many, many uh, implications for that word. So we call it a deliberate disposal. Uh, but to get to this point, we really had to, you know, think about everything that we had, all the data that we had, how to fit it together, and then make the story. So I, I, for me, I think that's a, a dialogue with dust, if you will. Um, so in 2018, I moved to the lovely city of Stockholm. And uh, one of the major sort of changes in my life when I moved here was, okay, well, how do I go about continuing these dialogues with fossils in, in Sweden? This is a very different environment. We don't have the cave systems that we find in Southern Africa that I'm used to working in and squeezing through. Uh, we, we also don't have the fossil hominins. We don't have human ancestors in, in Sweden. I mean, the first inhabitants in Sweden were only, only came into the country about 12 to 13,000 years ago. In Southern Africa, we're looking in the millions of years and we have fossil hominins there all the way up to 3.5 million years old. So it's a different, completely different scenario, different time periods uh, and a lack of fossil hominins. Um, that, that, you know, it was a very challenging thing for, for my career. Um, and so I kind of moved from the, well, we all know where Johannesburg is in the south there, all the way up uh, to Sweden. And it was interesting in discussions that I had with Eric prior to this talk um, that uh, the, I think it's unit 13 is working on this 26 degree line of, of latitude. Um, and you, you can see this little map here that Eric had drawn showing uh, that 26 degree line with various uh, points on it. And we have this line intersecting it there, which is going all the way up to Stockholm. And we have this intersection. We can call that intersection a coordinate and we can give that coordinate a value. We can give it an X and a Y. And uh, that coordinates can be used to pinpoint absolutely anything on Earth. And it's always used to do that. So I thought that was quite interesting. And I just wanted to put that into the talk a little bit. And hopefully I can talk a little bit more about it in, in, in a little while. So coming back to the stuff I was doing in South Africa, this is in contrast. So this is myself and Marina Elliott sitting in the uh, Lesedi chamber, one of the chambers where Homina Lady was discovered. Now in contrast, of course, as I said, there's no cave systems like this in, in Stockholm or even in Sweden. Uh, and this is the, the, the field or the site that I now work in. Uh, this is at the Center for Paleogenetics at Stockholm University. And you can see that we kind of look like uh, astronauts, I guess, uh, or something like wearing full hazmat, hazmat suits, two pairs of gloves. Uh, we usually have two pairs of footwear as well and sealers and masks and all these crazy things. And that's because something really special is, is occurring inside this lab. And inside this lab, we're, we're essentially looking at dust of a different kind. And what I'm talking about is, of course, uh, DNA, and more specifically, ancient DNA. Now, ancient DNA is, is, is quite difficult to work with because we don't have, of course, live participants that we can extract DNA from. Uh, you know, we don't have blood. We're only usually left with uh, fossil fossil material or hard parts, and it's quite it's quite daunting to work with. So you have to take a different perspective to working with ancient DNA than you would with regular DNA, for example. Uh, and this is all going on in Stockholm, but also around other places in the world, of course. Uh, but specifically in Scandinavia, this uh, ancient DNA techniques have have really been taking off and with amazing results. So in the lab, uh, we were able to extract tiny, tiny pieces of, for example, over here, uh, mammoth tusks, uh, to look at the DNA, or well, the ancient DNA. And it's very important to piece together uh, in, you know, important situations or important aspects of past animal uh, life and behavior, as well as migration. This is, of course, important for ecology and climate change today. But of course, we can also target ancient humans. 
Um, and this is just an example of some of the, the studies that have been going on in, in our lab. Uh, we have a lot of frozen animals from the permafrost in Russia. Uh, so at the top left there, we have what we call, uh, it's, a, it's a fox, some sort of fox. We have at the bottom, uh, a lion. So these are all found in the frozen permafrost. We have a mammoth's foot that you see on the bottom right there. And just recently published on the top right there is a bird found in the permafrost. It was 66,000 years ago, eight years old. So this, this material is of course really nice. This is sort of the best case scenario. You know, this is still frozen. We have in some cases tissue and uh, uh, skin left over from these finds, which is absolutely amazing. But when it comes to humans, again, it's very difficult. So one of the projects that I'll be starting quite soon is something uh, similar to this. And these are birch tar pitch. So the black uh, item right in the middle there on the left-hand side, that is what we call a chewing gum. And these chewing gums are found throughout Scandinavia, sometimes into Central Europe. And these chewing gums are pieces of tar or birch tar from trees. So they're essentially gums, uh, which people uh, many thousands of years ago used for various reasons. Uh, we don't know all the reasons, but one of them is for hafting tools. So they would use these gums uh, that, that extract it from a tree or tree bark. Uh, many times they chew on these gums and then use these gums to haft, for example, stone tools onto perhaps a wooden shaft. Um, and we find these chewing gums in the archeological record in Scandinavia. This is really, really exciting because well, up until 2019, just last year, no one had actually thought about looking inside these gums and extracting ancient DNA from them. And the first time this was done uh, was by someone, uh, Natalia Kashuba, uh, who had done this. She is at my lab in Stockholm, and she had shown that we can retrieve ancient DNA from these chewing gums. And this ancient DNA is really, really fascinating because we can tell a lot about what we discover about the person or the chewer um, from these ancient chewing gums, uh, a lot more than I think most people would really even contemplate. So for example, uh, just last year in December, this paper came out in Nature Communications. It was on a chewing gum from Denmark. So very similar to the one that we had seen from Sweden. And in Denmark, they had... Uh, they had done DNA or ancient DNA extraction from this chewing gum. And the particular chewing gum that I'm talking about now is about 5,400 years old. And they sequenced the genome of this uh, specific person. And to give it context, we have this really great um, reconstruction by Tom Bjorklund, um, which shows the, the genetics of this person, which I think is, is absolutely fascinating. We have a person with dark, darker skin, dark hair, uh, blue eyes, and we can even go as far as saying what the last meal of that person was before they had chewed that gum and discarded it on the landscape. And in the foreground there, you can see there's a duck or mallard and some hazelnuts. And these are actually picked up, the genomes of the, the duck and the hazelnuts are actually picked up along with the human genome. Uh, which we find inside these, these chewing, chewing gums. So this is absolutely fascinating. And it's really breaking, uh, you know, human evolution apart because we're now able to really extract a lot more data uh, than we had previously and, and different kinds of data, of course. So it's obviously very important to still make the paramount discoveries that we, we, we have, for example, in South Africa with the fossils themselves. But I think uh, drawing in lines with genetic evidence just strengthens what we already know about the fossil record. And just last night, uh, a number of papers came out in, in paleoanthropology, a number of important papers. So over here, the dating the skull from Broken Hill, Zambia, and its position in human evolution. Uh, this paper came out, uh, as I said, last night, and it's a, it's really a, um, a really fascinating study because this skull, which is a fossil hominin from Zambia, was thought to be much, much older, around 800,000 years old. 
Um, but dating it using these various techniques now that we have in laboratories, we have shown, well, uh, Chris Stringer and his team had shown that the broken hill, the Zambian skull, was actually about 300,000 years old. Uh, and it's, it's just fascinating stuff. And, and another paper that came out last night uh, was this one, the dental proteome uh, done by Frido Welker. And this is uh, really amazing stuff. So this is the oldest ancient DNA or, or proteome studies ever completed on an ancient human. And this is pushing back uh, what we can do with these types of data and extraction to 800,000 years ago. So that's quite a long time ago. In, this, in terms of paleontology, it's not really that long ago because we have fossil specimens in the hominin fossil record reaching back, you know, it's seven million years. And so it's really, it's really important for us to get genetic data from, from material like that. But there's always this debate if it's even possible because as I said earlier in the talk, you know, we have, we are working essentially with stone. We're working with lithified and fossil, fossilized. Uh, material and there's this huge understanding in in science which is which is getting torn down, uh, torn down very very quickly is that uh, you know prior to studies like this we thought well if it's fossilized there's definitely no form of ancient DNA there's nothing that we can get out of it um, and you know we could only push back ancient DNA studies to 20,000 years and this data is steadily been going back and back and back and back and back. And now we're at the point as of last night at 800,000 years. So this is really, really an exciting time to be in paleontology, but as well as paleoanthropology uh, and, and looking at our shared and common human past. Uh, and I think it's really, really interesting. So uh, yeah, that's kind of all from me. I hope there's some questions and I can maybe uh, get a little bit more involved with some of the answers. Uh, I, I tried to sort of align my talk with uh, with the dialogues with dust discussion, and hopefully I've done that. Um, but I think the important thing to to really look at is is constructing meaning uh, from from multiple pieces, multiple uh, lines of evidence, and uh, and constructing narratives from from fragments. Uh, which is what we're trying to do. And those fragments can be anything. They can be fossils. They can be, you know, any archaeological material or, or record, or they can even be DNA and ancient DNA. Um, I think that's the important thing is, is, is multiple uh, multidisciplinary work that, that brings out these really great results.